Welcome to our webin our continuing webinar series here. Um, today, our, our presentation by Dave Sinton is uh, entitled A New Standard for Energy, the Microfluidics Gambit. Um, I'm looking forward to your presentation, Dave. And before we get into that, uh, I'll just go through a quick few housekeeping things. Uh, my name is Stuart Kinnair. I'm the CEO of Interface Fluidics and one of the co-founders. Uh, and I'd like to welcome Professor David Sinton, who's the Executive Technology Advisor at Interface Fluidics and also one of the co-founders. Thanks, Stuart. And uh, thanks all for joining. This is fun. We get to look back today a little bit at the foundations of Interface Fluidics and then um, some of the present work that, that we're doing and then, and then also look forward. So, so this is great fun. And do uh, feel free to throw questions in the chat or or, or remember them, uh, it would be great if this is a discussion, we'll save some time at the end for, for chat. Great, so let's start with the past, early research that motivated the launch um, of Interface Fluidics. And you know, we're, we're humbled by the fact that micro scale uh, technologies have been around for, for um, a while, and actually, especially in, in, in geology, we'll talk about an example there, and then how we built on that. Uh, first, I want to touch on our, our global energy system. Uh, we're thinking about the past. We can look even further back over the past couple hundred years and think about what, what lessons there are in the path of global energy. This is by Canadian GEM, VACLAB, SMILS data, and, and BP statistical review. And, and I apologize, the bottom axis should be clear here, but take my word for it. It's a couple hundred years. And and a few interesting observations here. We, we can see the rapid growth over the last hundred or so. Um, and the other observation is that, you know, we tend to, we tend to add new sources well, and we've needed to do that to support an ever-growing population in a modern world. Um, we add efficiency. That's something that, 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 um, that there's great historical precedent for. There's no historical precedent for, for subtraction. Uh, you can see there's little dips along the way, but 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 those are mostly economic and and not and not really driven by uh, policy or by um, by need. Um, so you know the key takeaway is that demand demand will persist, and for their interface and for energy uh, companies, energy researchers worldwide, the big questions are, you know, can we make the conventional energy industry more efficient? And, and then can we utilize or store CO2? Can we do something with the CO2 that's produced from, from current operations and current processes generally? Um, and those are really the two central questions that, that are before the field. If we look back in our niche of the world, which is, which is microfluidics for energy and nanofluidics for energy, I mentioned the earliest micro models dating back to, to the 50s. And, and you know, this is really uh, cool work. You've got, you've got you know, researchers trying to understand using these, what they thought of as our cross sections of porous media packed beds. And um, lots, of, lots, of, uh, lots of early work there that, that really informed microfluidics generally. And, and that's a field that's really grown, especially in, in, uh, in, um, in health applications. And then we've really picked up the mantle and developed it for energy applications. I mentioned the, the health applications. There's, there's too many to, to give a proper number of examples for here, but some of the key benefits of those medical um, applications of microfluidics are, are in processing small amounts of sample. Right, The idea this lab on a chip vision, there's journals named after lab on a chip concept uh, and there's a human tremendous body of work there and and the vision is small amounts of sample because humans have a small amount of sample and doing analytical chemistry on those small samples and this is inevitably at low pressures and also the channel sizes that are generally used are micro scale channel sizes and that's really because they're convenient to work with but also because they match the size of living cells our world, which is microfluidics for energy applications, really borrowed a lot from this. So we, we owe a debt to the, to the health, um, the, the researchers motivated by health applications in terms of our nanofab and our microfab, um, but they didn't help us much with pressures uh, or temperatures 
or for that matter, with, with stability uh, in the presence of challenging solvents and chemicals. That was really our challenge when we developed microfluidics for energy applications, pressure and robustness. Here's a very early work uh, down memory lane for me. Um, this was a, a micro model, not unlike in concept what we saw a few slides back in the 1950s, but here with, with not with a packed bed, but rather with an, with an engineered set of, of channels designed to match the, the porosity uh, of the, um, and the connectivity of the reservoir, in this case, the CO2 injection. This work was our first work in this area was funded by Carbon Management Canada out of University of Calgary. And you know, this chip really shows what the kind of things that we, we could get to it with, a, with a microfluidic system. We can see two-phase two -phase transport here, in this case, a gas filling into a reservoir of liquid. This was neat. We could actually see the, see the CO2 dissolving into the liquid. Why? Because it's dimming the fluorescence here. So that was kind of cool. We could get this picture that looks like a simulation, uh, but it's not. This is actually really coming off a microscope. And we can see where CO2 in this case is flowing in the reservoir. And then we can see solid precipitate. So that was a headache for companies uh, at that time and remains a bit of a headache. CO2 forming, um, drying the reservoir fluid and leaving crystals. So this was, a, this was a very particular application, but what it showed us was the opportunities of microfluidics to understand reservoir behavior, one example. Another type of system that we, we develop at interfaces is not a model of a reservoir at all. It's, it's really just using the, the small scale channels to, to uh, measure fluid properties. And, and diffusion is one, and we've got others I'll show examples of later on. Um, but in this case, again, this is a bit of a, a walk through memory lane for me, down memory lane. In this case, it was, it was um, CO2 diffusion into, I think, a reservoir of fluid. In this case, I think it was uh, brine. And, uh, and we could see the, uh, the CO2 moving in, in uh, solution, and then from that back out, the diffusion coefficients and this was all pretty fast. Um, so the accuracy was on par with past methods. And this is a few seconds, right? 15 seconds. 15 seconds is a very different than the amount of time one usually budgets for a, <laughs> for a fluid property test at a conventional lab. So again, here are the, the take home for us and for interface is, wow, um, microfluidic design, you know, bespoke design measurements that use microfluidic length scales can tell us a lot about fluid properties and fluid fluid properties, in this case, diffusion. Here's one applied to, to enhanced oil recovery. So this is, this is um, I'm gonna show you two examples here uh, coming up. This one is the simpler of the two. Um, I love this one because of its simplicity. Um, oh, here we go on the right-hand side is the, is the chip. So this is a dead end channel, which is I believe the simplest microfluidic channel one could possibly make. Um, it's, a, it's, it's just a little dead end road here. We've got oil sample in the back of it. And then as we bring in CO2, we, we see oil swelling, right? This is what we would expect in reservoirs. CO2 moves into the oil, oil the oil uh, volume swells. And then we can see that just like when reads a thermometer. And then we get oil extraction here um, at, at high enough pressures once we get over the, the extraction pressure. And this is neat. You can actually see this playing out here. There's some video clips from different points as the pressure goes up. We've got this large degree of swelling and then at five or six megapascals, we start to see extraction. Um, so there was a ton of data come off this thing. So again, this is the, the type that I showed a second ago, inspiration from here. This is a, this is a system that allows us to get to fluid properties very accurately. And here, pushing pressures up a bit. Interface is now way beyond this in terms of pressure capabilities. But this for, for where the field was at this time was a, big, was a big success. This is the Ferrari. This is more complicated and, and a little bit, um, I want to say decadent almost in terms of the, the complexity we built into this thing. It was really a cool project. Um, the concept was, could we, could we develop a full phase diagram? Could we measure all the pressures and all the temperatures and get to the, to the phase properties? In this case, of a, uh, the model mixture was, uh, was a methane and, and, uh, and a propane mixture. And it's got a really beautiful phase diagram. You've got 
if you're trained in engineering as I was, you've got textbooks at home that, that show you this two-phase diagram, but you've probably never seen it really plotted um, with, with you know, sort of in one system all at once. Any one single measurement is typically what is what a, a lab would do in a PVT cell. Here's a thousand or so of those PVT cells acting in parallel all at the same time. If we think about nanoscale structures, here we were really inspired by all of the growth um, in, in the US, really led by, as an academic, I have to say, with some humility, right, led by industry. So, so the unconventional oil and gas industry really had no precedent until folks in industry really pursued it. And we were interested to understand how does this work? How do these systems that have nanopores and nano throats and both of those at extremely different length scales, how could this possibly behave as a physical system? And, and that was an important uh, question, remains an important question, just because the size of the, of the resource is immense. Um, so here, uh, here's two examples. One is kind of what I mentioned, the micro model kind of situation where we've got, we, we're, we've got a model, a physical model of, of the subsurface. And this one on the right, which is not a physical model at all, but it tells us it's an analytical instrument for telling us what's happening in the nano channels, what's happening in the micro channels. And I always say the micro channels are so well behaved. They're, they're just, they're like my good children. You know, they do, they do what they're told. <laughs> the dew point arrives at the right temperature and pressure. And nano channels, these are the bad children. These really, really challenging um, uh, scale dependent phase properties, challenging. And, and, and wonderful and beautiful and interesting and uh, motivating of lots of important measurements. Great, if we skip to the, to the present day, um, we think about how the company is taking these capabilities really to the next level. A reminder for me is that, um, and I need to be reminded of this, Stuart will, 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 uh, will support that I need to be reminded of this about once every two weeks. And that is that you know exciting new method in the lab. What what looks done to me and supported for an academic journal is is a long way from a commercial measurement. And 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 I've learned that lesson, or at least I learned that lesson every two weeks um, in in my work with Interface. So the, there's been a tremendous amount of work done to go from see it works in this particular model case um, to to here's an offering that that's robust and reliable. And, uh, and, and, and can take the variability that customers samples, customers, different projects can, can throw at it. So a few examples here where there's been, where there's been a real hit um, with uh, interfaces services. Um, this one here, um, this is responding to the, to the reduced costs and energy use. This is companies looking to interface to save money, save, um, save chemical use, uh, in, in reservoirs. So it's really challenging, of course, to know what's going on in these complex reservoirs and to know what's going on in the subsurface generally. Uh, add to that some, some chemistry uh, that's, that's supposed to do this or supposed to do that. It's really challenging to make those decisions as some in the audience will, will, um, will know better than I do. So this, this tool gives a bit of a window into that into that process. You can see the chemical operating, in this case, coming into a high, uh, high permeability zone. And then how does, it, how does it influence flows in this complex matrix where you've got nanopores and you've got larger pores? How does that uh, fluid behave? So this has been, this has been a real success. And, and um, in contrast to some of the academic -y stuff I showed earlier, this is kind of industry tested, uh, robust, system that, um, that, uh, that, that one needs in, in a commercial offering. Here's an example where uh, in some work where, with, with Primax um, where the, uh, this chip did what it did well, it does best and that is really inform on how much chemical or how if chemical is useful at all uh, and, and how much is, is necessary. In this case, the question was, you know, could we reduce the concentration from from what was what was recommended, and still get and still get the expected uh, outcome, or close to the expected outcome. What's the what's the cost curve look like for this? Um, so, won't show you all the tests here, but but um, interface was able to show that 
that uh, that reducing the the the, the chemical uh, concentration input and tuning other parameters could get to similar recoveries that was predicted in our in our labs in Edmonton. And and what's great about this um, story is that it's got a it's got a real well had uh, ground truth to it. So the, the, they indeed uh, were, were delighted when they did a test. They really they didn't believe us. Uh, they 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 tested it equivalent production from less chemical use, more sample, more data, and safer operations. Um, safety is something that that of course is top of mind whenever you're you're doing any lab work of any kind, but especially when you're thinking about high pressures. Here, microfluidics is, is, is just offers such a great, just a better operating system, if you will. If you think of the example of, of hydrogen, it's a very light molecule and, and, and storing it at pressure can be challenging for a number of reasons. If you think about having 170 liters tank, commercial tanks, um, the, the explosive pressure, the mechanical pressure, if you, if you, if you will, um, is equivalent to a very substantial explosion. Um, on a chip, you just have radically less volume. Uh, so here, um, you know, there's 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 really not much of a pop for the energy equivalent to lift an apple, uh, thirty centimeters. So the the key the key message here is that working with smaller volumes, um, uh, we we can we can a have have higher we can reach higher, um, just it have benefit from from reduced risk across the board because the volume is small. All right, fast forwarding into the future here and and keeping an eye on what are the next opportunities. And, and here are some uh, near term, and then we can chat about some further term ones as well. You know, key for us is to think about our current clients and we're, when we're benefit from really working with, with um, some of the biggest, I was gonna say the biggest energy companies, but in some cases, the biggest companies period uh, worldwide and helping those folks find efficiencies in their operations and reduce emissions. So that's really, that's really front of mind. And that's what they need us for. In some sense, it's what they've always used us for. It's saving, uh, the example I showed earlier, saving chemistry, saving energy, that's, that's what we do well, saving cost. Here's a few examples of, of some that are, I guess, in between the two sets of examples I've shown today, not way out uh, early stage academic stuff and not, and not um, um, commercial stuff running every day, stuff that's, that, that's, 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 um, that's next, next in line is the EOR measurement. And here we're looking at screening surfactants, polymers, nanofluids, emulsions, CO2 foams, solvents. It's a really very capable all around industrial um, testing chip. And, and it's got lots of benefits compared to core testing, um, which of course is, has, has, uh, um, has, has a an, an range of benefits, but also a lot of cost. And, and here we provide what we always provide, which is that, that insight in terms of what's happening in pores, quantitative nature, um, and, uh, and speed or themes that we've talked about over the last few minutes. Minimum miscibility pressure is a, is a measurement that's now commercial and we're looking to scale up our operations here. We've had real success in, in this. It's a, it's um, a nice, uh, I don't want to say simple because it, it, it belies the incredible amount of work that went into it, but, but in, in concept, uh, simple testing system that can replace the slim tube um, um, MMP measurements and really do what we think would be a better job and, and compare we, the, the, the column on the right hand side there compares directly our accuracy with theirs in terms of error. Um, we think we can squeeze that even further. Um, so I think the, the, the exciting part here is a slim tube measurement that is compatible with, with, uh, with more expensive, uh, more challenging slim tube measurements and in the future uh, can be even better and can be better via two ways. One, repeatability, and two, just by repeating the measurement, right? If we can do it faster, we can do more of them. Um, we can really do a suite of measurements where one couldn't have afforded that previously. Lastly, there's a joint industrial uh, project going on at JIP, and this has really been a big, big, uh, exciting effort and interface, and it's taking us to a new way of thinking about things. You know, we've done all the work I presented here in Edmonton in a lab where everything was, you know, fixed, <laughs> bolted down, and 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 this is. 
this asks the next question, which is, you know, can we take these these operations and, and bring them to bring them to labs worldwide? Um, and this this solves a few. This is really a, us listening to our our um, our clients' uh, needs and, and and requests, and, and it wasn't um, it wasn't uh, an easy proposition really to take what's developed in a in a really heavy duty experimental facility in Edmonton and think how one could put that into a into a shippable um, automatable system uh, like we have on the right, but it's become a real um, uh, a really nice um, now hardware. Uh, offering, along with what you can't see here, which is a great batch of software, which helps make it all um, help it all make sense and really get the value out of out of this system. And also, too, the the, the real magic, of course, happens in this blue box here, <laughs> right? That's where that's where the microfluidics um, and the, all the capabilities we've talked about today happen. So we think about this. We think about this as Stuart Spider diagram and real vision for the company. We work our way from the inside out here: fluid properties, phase diagrams, flow assurance, and fluid interactions. And we've got sort of a got them, got them, need them set here. I talked about MMP and diffusion, asphaltine onset, wax appearance. I didn't have a chance to talk about those, but you can think about them having been inspired by some of the early work where we were able to visualize solids formation on a chip. We're very good at that. Um, and then and then moving outwards here, this is the current work of the company developing out the gray through um, through this JIP. I mentioned the, the value earlier about reducing the amount of sample required and and uh, it's not trivial. It's a logistical challenge. It's an energy challenge getting that sample to a, to a site in Edmonton from somewhere around the world. It really is challenging. So so bringing our hardware to the world is something we're really excited about and our software, of course, uh, to support that. And, and I think it's, it's going to be, uh, it's going to bring, um, it's going to bring benefits, of course, from logistics, but, but more importantly, from the number of tests that we can enable as a company, we can really get these out um, and, and, and turning uh, thousands and thousands of tests. Um, per year, and that's when the hardware will really show the, the approach will really show its its uh, its merits. Great, I have saved a few minutes here for for uh, discussion. So welcome, uh, welcome any questions. Thanks for your attention. Well, thanks a lot, Dave. Um, we've got a few questions in the chat here that came in while you were talking, but uh, I encourage anybody else who's still around to um, if you've got questions, uh, now's the time. Um, first question is, you know, you talked a bit about CO2 and that's where you started, but, um, you know, what are your thoughts on other sort of, you know, quote unquote, future fluids uh, that we should be thinking about? So um, where do you think that's all going to come from? Yeah, um, you know, I spend a lot of time uh, thinking about that question and and there's lots of choices. Um, the one project we're working on now is, is you know, we talked about CO2 earlier here, but developing fluids for capture. That's such an important area. And, and the fluids right now aren't good enough. So how can interface uh, help them develop, help them screen fluids for those applications? That's a, that's a big one. Um, geothermal energy is another area, right? That's very familiar. And the best stuff in geothermal energy right now is coming straight out of oil and gas technology. And I think here, we can, we can uh, follow that playbook, right? We've got great technology for understanding oil and gas reservoirs um, and, and how can, and, and we can apply that to the growing geothermal, um, geothermal uh, industry. And, uh, and, and I have some current work on, on trying to develop some fancy fluids for that industry. I think, I think that hopefully we can prove that out in the lab, Stuart, and that can be a growth area for interface. Um, and the other one is in, is in, uh, it's a bit of a hobby for me, but pet, uh, thermal fluids, you know, the, the stuff we looked at today, some of it was at high temperature, sure, but it, but the purpose of the fluid there wasn't to cool or to heat. It was, uh, it was, it was just happened to be at high pressure or high temperature because the reservoir was, but, but in, you know, on the surface here and the global energy transition, there's going to be a lot of need for, for, um, for heat and renewable heat and new approaches to that. And, 
we need rapid testing systems for thermal fluids, so thermal properties, stuff that we haven't done yet. Very interesting. Um, and we've got about two minutes left here before the end. So if there's any other questions, let me know. But um, I'm, I think you sit in a unique position or a relatively unique position, um, sort of sitting both in, in an academic role as well as with a, a corporate or a startup or a technology company or whatever you want to call it kind of role. Um, you know, can you tell me a bit about how you see your role in that, in that sort of sitting between those two worlds? Yeah, I, well, I guess the first thing is that it's a fortunate one. Um, you know, it's great to be, if you think about just a purely academic perspective, there's this haunting, when you get to be my age, there's this haunting feeling like my stuff's never going to amount to more than a pile of papers. Um, where, so interface is an example where that, that, that's that been proved wrong, where, 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 where people can really develop this and run with it. So that's, that's, um, that's one perspective. The other thing is just is, is to to continue to try to be useful to the company to to develop those far off techs those try to try to look at 10 new technologies new directions that interface could pursue and work on them because that's the only way you're going to find the one or two of that set that are really going to have industrial traction and then the other one is is trying to train a very specialized workforce it's kind of a strange set a strange and important set of of uh, skills right microfluidics for energy it's it's a uh, it's a very specific and important um, realm, but but being able to provide folks that have that expertise, that's a, that's a core part of my my role. Great. Well, thanks, Dave. Um, that brings us to the end of our time here. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us.